Hi out there in Guitar Modern land. Um, I'm really excited to present this interview with Jonathan Crossley. He's kind of like the poster boy for modern guitar. Um, i tell you a little about him. He was born in Dublin, um, grew up in South Africa, and is now living in London. He studied classical guitar uh, extensively, then studied jazz extensively, but then got involved in the interface between guitar and electronics and started off by building this Frankenstein-looking unit that um, allowed him to control, um, not MIDI, but actually, I think, control voltage on pedals, and then moved on to MIDI and computers and and has done amazing work. He currently has three new records out, uh, one with a trio, uh, bass and drums, one with a piano player and one with someone playing cora anglais through electronics and they all sound terrific uh we had a great conversation and uh i'm looking forward to you hearing it uh before you do i'd love to thank my sponsors red panda and uh um earthquaker devices uh please visit the guitar modern site click on their ads they make great stuff and uh, if you're a modern guitarist you should have something of theirs on your board anyway sit back and enjoy my interview with jonathan crossley um you you are kind of the poster boy for guitar modern and i you know i've known that for a while well just because of uh i, I think when i first discovered you and saw you dressed like RoboCop, um, you know, with that Ibanez arch top and 6,000 switches and 1,200 knobs on it and, uh, you know, doing your best to get all digital um, with it. But that said, I, I want to start at the beginning. First of all, you're the first South African guitar player I've spoken to, and I was curious what, what it was like growing up in South Africa grow, uh, playing guitar. Well, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I guess, lots of people have had different journeys. You know, there are, I mean, I mean, there are there are fans of guitar modern, like you know, in South Africa, I'm not the only one, and there are guys doing modern stuff. You know, um, but I think everyone's journey is slightly different. You know, um, I I started classical guitar when I was six, and then went on to do a, a first degree in in classical guitar, and then and then figured, okay, I was enjoying that, but I, I couldn't improvise. There was a great kind of South African guitarist at that time, a guy called Johnny Faree, um, who was at Ronnie Scott's in London. And, you know, so he had a, he was a great guitar player. And so I went to learn with him because I couldn't improvise um, after that. So I went on and did a master's in jazz and then, and then toured a bunch and did a bunch of performances and then wound up like Robocop eventually. But, but grow, growing up, I guess, you know, it, it varies from community to community, but I mean, mine was very much a classical upbringing, but that was just really per chance. It was because a particular town that I grew up in, there was a good classical guitar teacher, which looking back at it was quite unusual, I guess, but you know, that's, that's the journey that I took. Yeah, I'm just curious about the music scene in South Africa in general, you know, especially, I guess, um, the avant-garde music scene, uh, how much of one there is, and and uh... oh yeah, I mean, I mean there is there's a, definitely a scene. I mean, you know, there's um, there's a, a new music essay, is a composers organization, um, uh, on which um, I don't know if you know Lucas Ligeti, um, yeah, sure. Al Mars has a has a trio with him, you know, um, Lucas is on the board of that organization, so and uh, they had a since they had a conference at the end of 2019 just before corona hit us and they had a luke uh, hotkamp was there and then i was there playing and lucas and so there is a scene and they've just done a, a an acoustic festival now as well and then there's obviously um there's guys doing more experimental jazz work um you know like the guys that i'm i was working with on this most recent stuff there's guys like that and then there's guys doing there's a lot of guys starting to do modular a bunch of guys doing some modular experimental work in that in that area as well so it's i mean i guess it's not massive but it but it's definitely vibrant and alive in its own way right yeah the modular thing's amazing i mean i just remember over the course of five nam shows it went from a tiny little corner to this huge area um i you know i mean my theory is it it appeals to people who maybe don't have a lot of musical background but want to make cool sounds 
and <laughs> you know, for and have money and for a couple of hundred bucks and it's great for a couple of hundred bucks they can start putting together a module modular system and make all these great sounds and have a blast you know um and uh have you ever worked with it in conjunction with uh with guitar um yeah i mean you could i think you can see to my oh there, yeah in the back sure. yeah yeah there's a little little animal I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it that i'm busy building and then and you know and then a lot of the work that i'm doing with with ableton at the moment is kind of approaching approaching uh the sessions um, when we can talk about it with that, but like approaching the sessions sessions in a modular way, so um, thinking about the routine and the way the guitar behaves within it within the the Ableton environment in a modular sense. So um, that hardware rig is is really new, like like within the last month, the little thing there, and it's it's integrating with the stuff that I've already done. But then the the plan is to feed the guitar through it for sure. Um, and also using like these MIDI guitars, these Casios that I've been into, to tr to trigger the mod modular system. So integrate the two, you know. But before we get into that, um, yeah. and all of that, I, I I'm I, I'm curious, how did you move into the digital area and the, you know, the um, the interface between the guitar and the digital realm? Um. Yeah. It's a. It's a. I guess it's a journey a, a, a lot of guitarists, a lot of us have been through, which is um, maybe out of frustration. Um, I was touring, I had a little quartet, and I was touring a bunch between South Africa and, and the Czech Republic. I was some musicians there, like in the mid-2000s, late 2000s. And I just found myself um, on those tours, both in South Africa and over there, like finding myself more and more and more spending time soloing on the floor, which is very frustrating. So, winding up like playing, trying to play solos with the left hand while, so I could get my fingers onto a, a, a button and, and move the fold to, you know, in, in real time. Um, and just getting increasingly frustrated with that. And so all the kind of explorations of the last 10 years have not been so much about like some kind of, um, what's the word, a aesthetic kind of digital impulse or like, you know, fetishization of, of the digital. It's it's more like you know ways to try and, and um, get effects as much as the effects boxes behind you, but get them to respond within it, the same sort of immediacy that you would get off the hand. And so the the digital's always been subservient to that rather than the other way around, you know. Well, that yeah, that's always been the issue, and and uh, it's been the issue for electronic musicians as well in terms of pure electronic musicians in terms of getting that physical response that you get from playing an actual instrument. And I noticed, I mean, you, you initially got involved, I guess it was as part of your PhD thesis in that thing that you built, that bodysuit that you built to control electronic stuff. Were you using that with Max or, um, or pedals or Ableton? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that, you know, that, that involved a bunch of other decisions as well. I mean, th it would have been easy to have done it with Max and easy to have done it with Ableton at that point. Um, but, I mean, maybe retrospectively, I don't know, maybe it wasn't the wisest, but, but I had this idea to make it hardware, you know, at that point. It was like, I didn't want to give up on the idea of, of hardware. So that, that exoskeleton thing... Um, actually controlled hardware boxes so I was using a lot of actual traditional pedals that I was much more familiar with that had some sort of MIDI interfacing and then it was a matter of um, uh, working with a computer program I, I can't code but working with somebody who could code to code the suit to send the right sorts of MIDI messages out curtailed in such a way as to um, trigger the hardware devices so to try and maintain the tactile, because I, I was kind of worried, like, you know, um, of going, you know, you already see laptop musicians perform, and I saw a lot of laptop musicians just sit behind the computer, and I didn't like that. And I wanted to make, I, I was scared if I went down the Max route, like at that point, or the Ableton route at that point, then, I don't know, maybe I was worried about something I shouldn't have worried about. But anyway, it, it, that's what it was. And uh, so the, the suit actually really controlled hardware. It didn't control software initially. Um, the stuff I'm doing at the moment kind of came later. Maybe I, I got over that, I guess. Well, yeah, the, I mean, there's the danger, of course, 
we've all seen with electronic music and electronic musicians of looking like you're reading your email or watching <laughs> your video while you're performing. Um, I was curious, did you ever try, uh, experiment with the hot hand, the source audio hot hand? Did you, were you aware of that? The, the, the one with the, the yeah. gyro? Yeah. It came out at about the same time, but I, I actually didn't, didn't get one. Um, I did a bunch of experiments. We, we looked at, um, I had someone assist me initially, and we looked at ribbon controllers. So I, I, I put a ribbon, a, a flex, uh, not a flex potentiometer, a ribbon controller on the back of the neck. So the idea was then you could raise the thumb up, you know, and, and control filters and trigger things that way. That didn't work great. Uh, what else? I looked at the same stuff as Imogen Heap, you know, the flex potentiometers in gloves and stuff. I looked at that. Couldn't get that to work so well. And then the the skeleton thing that you saw um, actually wasn't a, a pure build from scratch. It was an old advert I stumbled on um, from Sound and Sound magazine for this thing called the Sonolog Gypsy Controller, which was from the, I think, late 90s. Or a very, very corny ad. You can find it on YouTube of somebody dancing in a kind of neon leotard thing and uh anyway so I, I i tried to hunt the thing down and, and the company had gone bust but there was one i think one suit left in a warehouse in brighton in england and uh managed to get it off over and then just used the frame of that and hacked the insides out but um you know the the the, the thing the thing for me is even with the the gyro that you're talking about you know it, it's about being able to for me, I was trying to find a way to be able to play and maintain traditional technique, but then, you know, use other parts of the body that could be moved without affecting the moment of playing. Um, and that's harder than you think, you know, because, you well, know... It is, you, yeah, it is hard. I mean, I, I, what I found with the, with the ring was rather than wearing it on my finger, I attached it behind the nut on, on the guitar so that I could just, you know, keep playing but move the... Uh, move the neck of the guitar to affect the gyro aspect of it. But yeah, that was the initial problem with the hot hand. I mean, even well, at the beginning, they had it attached by a string to the pedal, so that was a no-go. Oh, yeah, uh, once, yeah, yeah. they, once they separated it, um, that was better, but it's always been an issue of how do you play and manipulate it at the same time? I mean, um, you know, that suit, obviously, like you say, from move, being able to move other parts of your body, that definitely allows you to do it. Um, but so since then, though, I, I, it looks like you moved on. Um, I, I love the videos at the Wits Art Museum with that percussionist whose name I will not endeavor to pronounce. Oh, yeah. Um, it looked like in that video you were using um, the, what is it called? The Livid Guitar Wing Controller. Which yeah. I experimented with a little. How do you like that? Oh uh, yeah, that, that's fantastic. That's right next to me. Um, it's um, it seems that I think the company has gone now. The guy went through some health, or I, th I don't know if he's passed away, or I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I know Mol the Moldover. I don't know if you're aware of him. Uh, Moldover. When I first started doing electronic music with the guitar, it was through Warper parties in New York, and. Okay. This guy Moldover was a guitar player, a really good guitar player, who built guitars with MIDI controllers in them that he used to control a laptop, you know, and control Ableton and control, you know, trigger, trigger clips and effects and everything. And he worked with, I believe, with the Livid people, and oh, that's wow. where that thing came from because it has a lot of the same kind of controls that he. Um, that he was using on his guitars. And, um, and he since then works with some people who build full guitars like that. And you can order custom guitars with all of that built into it. But uh, yeah, I mean, my issue with the wing was that it didn't, I couldn't get it to fit on a Stratocaster, you know, properly. And, and uh, so I sort of abandoned it at some point, but you had well, it, it on a Telecaster at one point, but it looks like you have it on some sort of Strat type instrument there. Yeah, that's my Casio. Um, no, I, the the, solu the problem was, you, like you say, very hard to fit. And uh, it's because the bracket was quite chunky. So uh, I screwed the whole thing apart and took the bracket off. And uh, the little lithium battery was inside the bracket. So I took the battery out and I rewired it. And it's just kind of glued to the back of the unit. And then 
put Velcro on your scratch plates. So it's an easier solution because it was very uncomfortable to play. That was the one thing with it, you know. So once the once the brackets off, it's really a lot easier to mount and take off. But but as a unit, it's amazing because you know the pads are pressure, the the toggle and pressure, and so and you can program it so you can build different kind of scenes for it, and then and just kind of ping them onto the device, and then and then use them for different things. But honestly, I I developed the, the settings that are currently on it. I guess about three years ago, and I haven't changed them since. Since it's become very familiar in the same way as a, a standard instrument would be. Um, but yeah, that's a super duper useful unit, you know. Uh, is, is does it have? If I'm memory serves, does it have a gyro in it as well? Um, it does actually, because there was a, um, you know, on the original Livid Wing um, kind of little app, which is a basic set of effects. If you kind of wangle the neck like the way you were talking about the headstock, um, uh, it, it did have a Wawa set in there. But I, I've actually got this disabled. I'm not using that at the moment. I found the the most useful thing is the large ribbon controller, um, just for tricky reverse delays and. That really, really is easy to integrate into your playing practice, which, are, you know, after all, is the big thing. You don't want the, the unit to govern what you're doing. Right. You want it, yeah, you want it to be as, as natural as, say, swelling a volume knob or yeah. something on, on the guitar. And ribbons seem to work really well for that. I'm trying to remember, is it, it connects, like, through Bluetooth or wireless to a, a device that goes into the laptop and then... Um, yeah, yeah. It, it had a, it had a bit of software that came with it uh, to do some things, but I'm not using that either. It's just going. It can connect via Bluetooth, and then Ableton um, can see it. And once you know, once you can map it, then I actually haven't used the effects that came with it. It's just more as a controller. I, I found I found it super useful. And then like you know, I've got other little table controllers and things. But um, you know, even even the suit at the moment, the original suit, we're busy rebuilding and I've got somebody that's helping me reprogram a new Arduino for it. But, um, you know, once something settles in, becomes familiar, that's when it really becomes like kind of integrated into practice. And that was the goal at the end of the day that, you know, if you don't want to move the hand, you want to find something that doesn't, you know, force you to change your plane or affect your plane or interf you know, interfere with the flow of information. You know, that's got to bear the same on all the effects um, and their applications as well. Right. Well, I mean, it's always an issue with the guitar because just to manipulate anything, you have to take your right hand off, you know, stop playing and yeah. turn a knob. Even I mean, the volume swell thing is people have integrated it into being able to pick and do that at the same time. But yeah, but I don't know that you can use a ribbon controller and pick at the same time. Or can you? Is it, is it close enough to your finger to be able to manipulate buttons and and on the uh, on the wing at the same time that you're playing. So um, on uh, so on some recent work, I've been doing things where you know improvise a phrase, then improvise something with the ribbon, improvise a phrase, improvise something with the ribbon. That's useful. Um, but then the kind of modular thinking is where the for me the effects parameter changes. You know, once things are in a tempo environment. Um, modular thinking becomes really useful because then you're responding to things that are happening kind of quasi-automatically or in terms of the tempo governing the way those... So it becomes a much more complex environment, I guess, with sonically sounds that are kind of maybe not only from the guitar but from beyond the guitar, but they are now part of the improvisation. So it's like, I guess the focus has shifted a bit. So, our, well, that brings me to the next question about you know, what is your current setup and and how are you working it? How are you using it? Yeah. Um, so the the current the current environment, I mean, there, there are some basics to it, um, but but really the the most recent work of the last three years um, has has been quite uh, human specific, which is I suppose is ironic, but. But thinking about who I'm working with, so if I was um, s going to use one of these systems or, or setups, say with with yourself, I'm going to improvise with you, um, I'd kind of want to get to know you a little bit more first. So I kind of like, okay, you know, m you know, Michael likes this sort of stuff, or I've improvised with you and I've seen you. Oh, you go off, you really enjoy that, or you enjoy that. So, so, you know, uh, in the studio, I'm doing things where the record. The Ableton sessions that I'm playing through have been configured 
for the you know certain things in it that I know the drummer likes or certain things in it that the the bass player likes or the pianist or so that then uh, not only is the guitar happening but the but the entire session is kind of um, I don't know engendering or fostering the improvisational moment so so that there are some similarities in the thinking like that but in terms of in terms of the the guitar setup uh, but it's pretty pretty standardized I'm using a little Vox a um, little Vox head and this Casio guitar which has become my favorite it's it's had the pickups changed and things like that but but the Casio instrument because the MIDI unit is quite stable and then that goes into Ableton uh, using some uh, cab emulation from two notes I don't know if you know them yeah um, two notes? It's amazing. yeah yeah they um, they did a great set of Mesa Boogie. I used to play Mesa Boogie, you know, physical amps, and so their Mesa Boogie cabs are pretty good. Um, and then there's a daisy chain of of things inside 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 Ableton. So the guitar comes in, and then it's got an another channel that's switchable. That's got an octave on. It's got three different layers of delays, which have got their controls mapped to the to the livid wing. And then the MIDI side of it goes through some stuff by. Some Ableton synths and some patches and some native instrument stuff as well. Um, and then on top of that, there's usually now these days, there's usually some sort of, sort of generative loops happening as well in the background that are, um, which are tempo mapped. So the delays are tempo mapped to the same generative loop and all of that's controlled in the liver just with the tap button. So the whole tempo world can shift, you know, in a, in a moment if the drummer takes it in another direction. Off, off you can go there you're not you're not behest to the to the structure of a loop you know so yeah that's that's a lot of it um there's some some reactor i don't know if you know reactor yeah sure is, yeah so reactor blocks stuff i've got some of that in there as well and you program your own or are you using um <coughs> pre-programmed reactor um no i'm using the blocks um so a little a little bit of uh, one, one or two things that I've borrowed, and one or two things that I'm building myself. Um, but the generative stuff inside Ableton, yeah, that's all. That's all. That was the starting point, and that's all fresh and brand new, using some kind of free Max patches and things. Um, but so the loops cycle in different ways and, and never repeat in predictable kind of patterns. And then the odd bit of hardware hack stuff. I've got a little. A um, couple of little old effects pedals that are exposed, you know, the insides are exposed, which is good fun. And uh, I, I managed to get my hands on a, a Suzuki Omnicord as well, which was fantastic. So yeah. got the insides of that hanging out. So that it all kind of ties up together and produces a kind of lush kind of world. For people that don't know, the Suzuki Omnicord is the Daniel Wa instrument, basically. That's He's used it for years. I had one for a little while and just found I didn't, you know, use it enough to keep it. But... Um, it is, it's a very distinctive sound. Um, I was going to ask you, the Casio guitar, that was a MIDI guitar to begin with. So does it have its own controls on it that you can use to control things in Ableton? I mean, is the wing is an addition to its controls? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Casio is great. I mean, I, I didn't know about it, and I, it, it popped up on, a, on one of these um, Facebook secondhand forums, you know, for, like, for, for nothing. I couldn't believe, you know, so I jumped in the car, literally jumped in the car and raced off to the guy's place. And, uh, but it's got a, it's got like kind of, kind of like a G, guys will be familiar with a GK kind of system. It's got the kind of hex pickup in it inside and it's got its own converter. So it sends a five pin MIDI out. Um, the tracking is, is pretty amazing. I mean, um, you know, I, you obviously with all the MIDI guitars, you can't really play you know, loosely with the pick or whatever. If you've done some classical guitar stuff, it seems to really, really help, you know, just get that kind of right-hand precision. So it tracks great, and it's got a couple of octave switches, and you can switch between monophonic and polyphonic, etc. those things. And then it's got some other knobs, which were, I guess, for other applications at a point, but, but Ableton sees them, and so as soon as Ableton sees something, you can make it do something, you know? So... I'm not really using them, I think, for what the original purpose was, but that doesn't really matter anymore, you know? Right, as long as it's, it recognizes MIDI. Yeah. Uh, have you experimented with MIDI, um, the plugin, the MIDI guitar plugin? 
Yeah, I actually, I think I watched one of your episodes the other day and you mentioned it and, um, yeah, it has that, it has a similar problem to some of the Roland ones where it jumps around, it leaps and stuff, but, um, I have got it. I, I bought the actual tracking. plane as well. Say again? I mean, in terms of tracking. And also those random notes every once in a while, you know, where it's suddenly you get a, you're playing this delicate, beautiful little phrase, and I don't know why it picks up a harmonic or something, but the GKs do the same, and you have this screaming random note. Um, so, yeah, I've got that, and I, I find that Casio does that a little less for some reason. I'm not sure why. I don't know the the, um, the science behind that. But, but you know, um, in Ableton, you can... Uh, they have some beautiful little MIDI filters, right? And and you can kind of squeeze the range. And and I've I've played with that a little bit where you, you know, the, those notes that you don't want are always in a certain MIDI, I can kind of frequency range. They whacked out of the, you know, out of the out of the usable kind of pitches. And and on top of that, also dynamically, they kind of leap out. So if you settle for a constra constrained volume and constrained pitch range. You can filter your stuff pretty accurately, and that works both for that. Um, what is it? Jam Origin, I think it's yeah. called. Yeah, and 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 for these kind of hardware units as well. Yeah, it makes it makes me wonder that. Um, you know, I'm sure having played guitar for as long as you have, and as long as I have, you you realize that guitars put out different overtone frequencies. You know, every guitar puts out a different overtone frequency, and. It might just be that you know the Casio, even the particular Casio that you have, puts out a limited range of overtone frequencies. That so in some ways, you know, a guitar that might sound not as good as a standard electric guitar, you know, because because it's not putting out a wide frequency range of overtones, would be better for MIDI. You know, something deader in a certain kind of way might be better for MIDI than a live or you know a guitar that's more lively so uh it just be i it just occurred to me that that or it actually it has occurred to me in the past that 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 could be a factor in terms of midi guitar that depends especially notice i notice that because i use jam origin a fair amount and i use it because you don't need a pickup i use it with different guitars right and different guitars seem to track better some guitars seem to track better than others and it may be connected to that um so I wanted to ask you about, um, oh, I know, well, I, a couple of things. Uh, in the guitar gallery video, thanks for the shout out. Um, you were using oh, yeah. And uh, are you still using an iPad um, in conjunction? Um, yeah, um, not, with, um, not with every session. Like I said to you, the actual, you know, it's, it sounds like one is avoiding the answer to the question, but the number of different sessions is huge you know so it varies it varies from from band to band and moment to moment and even within a band you know so so that particular session yeah there was an ipad involved um i'm using um lima lima is the controller um that's mapped for that but that was really uh, you know quite frankly because i i can't use the uh delivered guitar wing on the acoustic because i'm not i'm not willing to glue some um, Velcro onto my Laravel <laughs> acoustic. Uh <-huh. laughs> there's, even for me, there's some lines you shouldn't cross, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. um, so yeah, for, for, definitely for that guitar, that was acoustic video, yeah. The, the iPad is useful then, but uh, preference is definitely to have the liver, to be honest. Right. Well, no, but do, do you ever incorporate the iPad in your practice with the, with the Casio and, and the Livid? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, having the and having the iPad on a clip on a on a mic stand, you know, especially live. I mean, in the days when live was still happening, but you know, especially live to have the iPad if you're standing up and playing to have it right there, you know, so I can get between the guitar and the iPad quickly, is much more useful than trying to bend down and grab a mouse or something. You know, there's something just so slow about the mouse and keyboard. The iPad, at least you can just touch it and move it. And then with Lima, you can do this, you can create the entire environment yourself. You can change the size of the knobs and the faders and customize it as much as you want. So, yeah, it's very, very useful then. Are you using any the apps, though, ever, like Borderlands? You mentioned Borderlands in, uh, in that video. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I did actually. You know, um, I, I used Borderlands on that because I just used it in the studio, and uh, I must say it's it, probably not the best way to use Borderlands, but it was good fun. Where we 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 got um, we were just gassing, you know, before before the recording and uh, and laughing. I was just I was just grabbing everyone's little chirps and laughing and stuff, and I threw that into the recording. So I think what was on that. <laughs> on that uh, guitar gallery video is actually little snippets of, of people chatting from before the recording session. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't anything deep or, I know you can root Borderlands through your, people, people play through it and stuff, but I, I, I must say I haven't gone there yet. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I was curious about. Um, so, oh, <laughs> I have to ask you about, that your, uh, your artist statement, the Sonomorph series is the <laughs> Framework exploring how digital ecologies mediate genre <laughs> fluid fluidity within polygenre improvisatory contexts. A zero point in ten years of performance and research from hyper instruments designing immersive technologies, compelling improvisational interactions and dialogues, a sonic morphology of future expression. Um, yeah, you have to come up for air somewhere in that. I was going to say, could you translate that? <laughs> it sounds, it makes sense to me, I guess, but, um, sure. Um, I think I, I, I think I have translated it for you. Maybe, I mean, if you unpack it, you know, it's like this, I, I, this idea of a digital ecology, you know, if you think about, if you think about what we were saying right at the beginning, like the idea of, of the machine being subservient to the improvisational moment. And not and not the ma the machine being its own thing. I mean, I remember about twenty years ago working with a, a double bass player, and uh, and I I was just starting to work with effects. So I was completely green, and I slept on a delay, and and the bass player got quite upset because it wasn't gelling, and it it stuck with me that moment. I mean, this would have been twenty two years ago, and and I just always thought then, okay, from that moment I realized like the 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 ecology if you think about a band as kind of an ecology where everyone's interdependent in the moment and um you know and the especially in free improvisation where where you, you know my i've got to remain aware of my own playing but i've got to remain aware of you and i've got to hear the kind of micro movements in the conversation that are happening all the time I mean, it's, I, I love those emotive details that are transferring all the time. And that's kind of an ecology where there's this just heightened state of interdependence. And, and for me, the best moments musically in groups happen when that's really working great. And so, so like this idea of a digital ecology and an interdependence between the two is like, okay, the, the complexity of the digital must never impinge on the, the sustainability of the system. And that's the idea there. So how do you ensure that that never ever happens? And that takes a, a, a great deal of work, I guess. And so this kind of sonomorph idea is like that, that the sound must always morph to the needs of the group, the needs of the moment and whatever those needs are. And so if something, you know, in years gone by, something would then have to go. It's just like, okay, we just don't use that or we'll just switch it off or whatever. But um, like these days I'm kind of, and in this series, you know, of, of recordings particularly, I feel very committed to like really push through the work that needs to be done and the thinking that needs to be done um, to make sure that the ecology is stable and that the kind of relationships, you know, are so finessed and cared for that the, the, the digital stuff disappears. Um, you know, the, the Ableton session must disappear, the effects must disappear, um, and... And I think in this series, for me, especially in, in these first two albums that have come out already, the I can I can I'm, when I'm listening back to them, I can hear the performers respond to none of us. They're responding to things that are happening from the, you know, from the machines, from the modular, from the the way the effects are behaving. And then afterwards, having conversations with them, I said, I heard you do that. Did you know? I, I thought that was you. No, no, it wasn't me. It was actually. It was Ableton, so they were having a little dialogue, you know, inside the ecology in the moment. So, 
so that this kind of thing curates the experience in a beautiful way. Um, so this whole series has been about that, like trying to bring that to a zenith. Um, and maybe in ways, you know, you, you're talking about the, the kind of the, the mechanical exoskeleton thing from the start of all this, which is what, six or seven years ago now. I mean, that really wasn't working so well for me. If I look back on those recordings musically and the way the band interacted, I can look at it and I think, oh, it was great as, as a piece of work or a start of a journey. But really this new stuff, this series is where I can see that everyone feels comfortable and nobody's um, being impinged upon by, by the systems that are around them. Well, that, I mean, that's fascinating because, I mean, it's, first of all, it's an evolution, obviously. And second of all, I, the first thing that occurs to me, it's also a two, obviously a two-way street. On one hand, you have to become so comfortable with the technology that you can respond to what the other players are doing with the technology in real time as quickly as possible. But from what you're saying, it also sounds like, I mean, it's, I, I believe you've been playing with the same bass player and drummer for quite a while. And through that, I, would you say that they've probably learned to respond to the technology better than they did at the beginning also? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that was being good, especially with that, um, you know, you, with the trio record. Um, the drummer I've been working with since 2007, and the bass player equally as long. Um, the bass player and I actually teach at the same university. And, um, you know, on this particular recent recording, um, th they were completely immersed in the thing and, and comfortable with it. Um, I'd say the the drummer was probably more more of a champion for the thing along the way, um, and um, maybe put up with things um, when they weren't all together working. Um, but uh, but definitely the response from the guys on on this last recordings has been much. Uh, much more excitement with what happened, and they, you know, there's these quizzical looks that happen at the end of a section, going, "What, what just happened here?" You know, and then you know, okay, that went, that all went, that went all right, that went good, you know. Um, so yeah, it it has been, it has been, it has been good. I mean, it's, and it's, and I'm really grateful, I guess, at the end of the day, for, for guys, you know, walking a journey with you because, um, you know, when you're pushing the boundaries so hard at certain points, it it could all fall apart. So yeah, it's been great to have the same guys, you know, see the thing evolve and stick with you at it. Well, the, it, the results are inarguable. The record sounds amazing. I mean, the more I listen to it, the more I like it. Um, Thank you. And it really has that feeling of integration that this, the sounds are integrated with the music and, and vice versa. Um, I was gonna ask you something that just flew right out of my head. Um, <laughs> but, um, Oh yeah, well, there's also the uh, well. Sh we should mention the records at this point. There's the Sonomorph record with the band, and then there's a record uh, duo with you and a uh, a person playing piano and Cora Anglais. Is that is that an English horn or? Yeah, yeah. And are they processing uh, that horn as well? Because I didn't hear anything that sounded to me like a horn. <laughs> okay, so the so the 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 first the first record you mentioned is the trio record with with bass and drums, and then there's a second record, uh, just on a morph two, which is with um, Kathleen Tag, who's a pianist in New York, um, classical pianist, and then the third record, which I think you've heard, but will only come out a little bit later, is with Cor Anglais. But but it, yeah, you're, the the performer there, Cameron Harris, is a real Max and Ableton fundi. Um, so he's playing through. Um, he's playing through a lot of pitch shifters. I don't. I'm, it's like so different to my thinking about how to apply effects. So he's got these dozens of pitch washes of things. So that's what you're hearing is actually a cor anglais going into those, um, and that's a th that's a third record. Right. So each each performer is different. You know, I mean the 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 cor anglais player is really another technological so there's two full different systems interacting there and then with the pianist it was just an acoustic piano and um prepared piano uh, she uses a lot of um horsehair you know from from bows inside the instrument and and so very much a prepared piano approach um so yeah just different approaches to acoustic and 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 electronic work 
Did you record the piano record pre-COVID or together or somewhere? Yeah, all of them were recorded together. Um, we the the piano the piano recording was actually done quite a long time ago. I think in twenty eighteen, um, and then was left and you know I, it was worked a little bit on, but I left because I wasn't sure it wasn't the right time to put it all together. The the COVID situation in Johannesburg. Um, you know, the, the rules have been up and down a bit. And so um, the both the Cor Anglais album and the Trio album were recorded, I think, in November. So, and those were recorded live in the same room, which which we were fortunate to do and fortunate to be safe through it, I guess. But um, yeah, I, it's, it's quite different over here in the UK at the moment. You wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, it seems to be different everywhere. Um... On the trio record, so I was hearing what sounded like overdubs, but I'm wondering, were they overdubs or were they just generative things? No, no, there are definitely overdubs on the trio record. Um, um, w w that's been one of the other learning curves for me um, is um, the, the kind of main, all these records were free improvisations, so there was no um, no compositions written down before. They were the sessions were shaped. So I'm kind of thinking about the the Ableton sessions almost in a John Cage sense, that they're kind of the way they shepherd the the, the improvisation in a certain direction. Um, but the the main parts, the melodies that emerge and the forms that emerge, uh, you know, like on the trio record are are completely on the moment. But then I say the, the development for me has been learning to be quiet at points. So there's certain points I've learned, I've learned not to play, you know what I mean? So that's, you know, and that takes a while I found. So <laughs> you know, you know, if, if I'm hearing the, you know, the bass player, Carlo's an amazing bass player and then, and then I'll hear him doing something and I think I want to get involved, but I haven't quite got a handle on where he's going harmonically or where the line's going. I think, okay, if I jump in here, I'm going to mess with the moment. So it's better just to, hang back and wait and then respond to it in an overdub sense. So the, the overdubs that you're hearing um, feel generative or feel improvised because their improvisations in the space is often that one would have jumped in and kind of messed up the moment. That's the way I'm, that's the way I'm thinking about it, you know. Oh, there, it reminds me of there's a Miles Davis story with a saxophone player who, uh, you know, who was playing too much and he comes up to Miles and he says, man, it just sounded so good. I, I, I just had a play and Miles said, it sounded so good because you weren't playing. <laughs> he's right, he's right. It's also space, I like to say space, the final frontier, you know, that's, it's, it's always, the urge is always to play and it, it, it takes a certain kind of restraint to leave those, uh, those spaces open. But whatever whatever it was, it all worked. Um, it all worked really well. Um, I was going to ask you about some of your earlier stuff. You know, it's evolved since Deep Space seems more beat oriented. I was listening to some of that and Blips you did with another uh, South African guitarist, um, Reza Kota. Yeah, he's a, also an amazing guitarist. Um, he's based in Cape Town. Um, uh, we've known each other since we were younger, but he moved down to the Cape. Some great albums. There's a great album called Transmutations, where he he looks at some Hendrix material and uh, his most recent record. And their name escapes me now, but Reza Kota, R E Z A Kota. Um, fantastic on that record. Blips. He was taking the main guitar role, and I was kind of doing a lot of processing. And I had a little Fender Jaguar, and I was pitching it an octave and a half, or sorry, an octave or two octaves down. Um, doing some bass work. And then at Deep Space is a completely different project altogether. Deep Space is with a, a bassist, um, Cesare Casarino, and a drummer, Etienne Oosthuizen. And um, Etienne, for instance, comes more from the theater background. So he's much more tempo oriented, and that's his his bent, you know? Whereas Jono would be more likely to go free. And uh, Cesare is a great groove player, amazing groove player. So so in that, in that project, it's using the same sort of technologies, but uh, but for instance, the entire Ableton environment, the tempo, um, is controlled by the drummer. So the drummer has a dummy 
he uses just a TD, a Roland TD, um, but it's it's a dummy. It just spits out uh, a, a tempo grid, and that comes then into my Ableton world, and then my Ableton world controls the bass player's pedals. So th the drummer controls the tempo, it controls all my tempo stuff. I can switch things on and off and add things in Deep Spacer, uh, and all of the bass players' filters and warbles and effects and stuff, they're all controlled from that. So. Like I said, like each session is a different model. So Deep Spacer, you are very tempo based, very groove based, much more contemporary rock forms and dub forms and things like that, but also free improvised. Yeah. Yeah. You speaking of controlling the bass player uh, effects in the museum um, performance with the percussionist, it sounded like you were sampling his percussion sounds and and doing things with that as well. Yeah. Um, that was again. That was again completely different. That was, that was a lovely gig. Um, it, the percussionist is in Paul Muller King, and um, we in that museum concert we worked with Fitz Archaeology, which is the archaeology department, and they'd done these drone lidar um, images of a pre-colonial Tswana settlement south of Johannesburg, and we decided to read those as a almost like a graphic notation. And then we were in this massive museum, and so we wanted, fr from the images of the, the Tswana homesteads, it's very much about being encircled. You know, the homestead encircles everything inside it. And so we decided, well, how can you do that with audio? So we put the audience, we put out a rug in the middle of the museum, and we put the audience around the group, or just the two of us around the duo, and then we put a quadraphonic speaker field out into the far corners. So there were four speakers spread out. And then um, I was facing Impor, and Impor was on this kind of rug area, and I put four um, pencil condensers to kind of create a quad field, which was then exploded outwards onto the quad field outside. And then that was also coming into Ableton replicated. I was able to sample him and process him live. So you had this completely kind of immersive experience for the audience and for the performers and then sampling things and playing back to him. Yeah, that was that was good fun. I'll bet. I mean, it must have been amazing to be there. Unfortunately, you know, that doesn't come through quite the same on the video, but it's still worth checking out. It's yeah. really great. Um, I would um, I also want to drill down a little bit more on your setup. Like when you're playing or, you know, recording live with the band, are you playing how are, are you going direct into something and then they're hearing you through e headphones or are you using an amp or or a couple in, of amps or in, in studio you mean or in a studio or if you guys play live how do you do it both how does it work yeah there's um some uh you, you get worried looks from either the, the studio engineer or the live engineer when you rock up because um it'll be like you know you, you put on the rider like bass drums and guitar and uh then uh they they see that I need 10 DI boxes. So there's, so, <laughs> so, so coming out of me, there's 10 lines normally. So, um, and then I will take, I bring my own mics as well. So, so anyway, start at the beginning. Um, the guitar goes into a little fox, little valve head, which then goes into two notes. So that's the guitar, that's pretty easy. The guitar also sends out MIDI. That's pretty easy. Um, in Ableton, then I split everything out. So you have the guitars coming out as one, the stereo delays so that things can be panned. Often we will run in quadraphonic, so then the synths will be at the front and the back and the guitar. And then the loops will go out on a separate line, the hardware hacked instruments, um, like the delay boxes and the Omnicore, they'll go out on a separate line. So everything is separated because if you blend everything, I think in, in Ableton and something goes wrong, then you're in trouble. Whereas at least you can mute something or mute, switch something off. So all my stuff comes out separate. Then th I'm using an interface and then I'll hang a, a mic over the drums um, or a couple of mics, maybe a kick and maybe an overhead. Um, if Jono's on the gig, sometimes we give him a, a nasty old um, condent ugh, dynamic mic with a switch. He loves doing that. He'll stick it on the drum and bang it and do things with it and move it under the cymbals. And then uh, with the bass guitar, I'll have another DI, which will split off to tap off the bass guitar as well. Um, so that it comes into the system as well. So everything's kind of going s in a circular way through this sound card. And apart from the need for a mountain of DIs, it's 
pretty simple, I guess. <laughs> well, simple, yes. <laughs> uh, what, what, what sound card are you using? What uh, audio interface are you using? Um, you know, in the studio, I've got like a, just a small SSL to track through, which is nice. Um, but, you know, you, you're going to laugh. Uh, I've got a Tascam US1608, which is a super duper cheap card. Um, well, I meant but to it's, go into the, what are you using to go into, I guess, audio interface is what I meant to go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the audio interface is this Tascam. It's, a, it's not an expensive one at all. It's a 1608. It's not well known. Um, it's got a bunch of ins and a bunch of outs, which works for live. And with Mac, the driver's rock solid. Um, also, just with gigs, you know, you don't want to be walking around with an apogee or something and something if you drop it or something horrible. So, so this thing has proved great. It's, um, I mean, I'm sure, you know, people are hearing Tascam 1608 and frowning at the D to A, but, you know, you're not using it for that. You're using it for live. You just want something stable and lots of I.O. Right, and you're, and you're mixing everything inside of Ableton? Yep. Yeah, everything's mixed inside of Ableton, and then everything has, um, you know, little Akai controllers and volume knobs and pedal controllers controlling all the mix levels and stuff, yeah. Yeah, I noticed you, you were using one video, or you were using that Behringer uh, foot controller. Which, yeah, which, I still got that right, right in front of me. Yeah, people, I mean, people who use it and can use it seem to love it. Um, but it, as I recall, you would, you needed third-party software to make it actually work. I mean, I tried to get it to work, and it would not, you know, it's not a plug-and-play foot controller. It, no. And uh, I'll confess to you, um, I remember buying it, and I remember the agony of not being able to get it to work. And then I remember getting some sort of software and redoing it, and I can't remember how I did that. It was long ago. Switch it on and it works now. So. <laughs> That's good. Well, that, that I, I totally relate to that because there's so many. I mean, there's so many learning curves that I've gone through to get things to work. Like I'm using this uh, iConnect interface that lets me use the iPad as a as a um, return, fetch, send, and return in Ableton. Oh wow! Yeah, it, it's amazing and it works. And but it was it was a nightmare for so long. Because their their software to route it was crazy, and you know, so if anything went down on a gig, I mean, I think it only worked on one gig, and there's no, it was no quick way to make it work. They've since updated the software to more; it's much simpler, and it seems very stable. So we'll see what happens when I go out and use it. But you know, I had to set up a whole routing system in Ableton to make that work, and it's not that complicated. But I, if I had to do it again. You know, right now I'd probably have to call them again to say, "How do I make this work again?" Yeah, because once it's you get it working, you just don't want to think about it. I mean, that's the nature of it. So well, that, that's the that's the appeal of modular. You know, in the sense that there's so many different little modules. If one goes down, so it's maybe maybe that's I'm going to wind up going around with a modular rig to most of the gigs in the future. Well, it's it's. It's interesting because that's kind of why people say they like pedals, you know. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you set up a fancy pedal board with a switching system, you know, if anything goes out, it's out of the loop, so you don't worry about that. All the knobs and, and you know, and switches are right there for you to deal with right on the spot. And it's, um, you know, they both have their advantages, as we both know. Um, I was going to ask you, though, um, just in terms of the live performance thing, so when you're doing that, once you're set up in a live performance, are you monitoring through monitors? You know, do you have stereo monitors, basically, or quad monitors? Or no, no, I'm just uh, I I kind of I just accept. What I'll try and do is I'll try and make sure that the, the ten outs are all at zero, and so that the engineer really. You know, whoever's at the front of the house, the engineer gets everything that's already limited and compressed and balanced, and so they basically just plug it in and then send me back zero as well into a headphone. So I'll run on I'll run on IEMs, um, oh, okay. and just accept that that's. And then I, you know, I I try to hear through the mush sometimes, and sometimes they get panicky. But you know, do, trying to do a quad setup or something for yourself, I mean, that's a real luxury. 
I mean, the, the gig with Paul was beautiful because there were no monitors. I was hearing what the audience was hearing. So it was, you know, if I remember back, it was a unique experience to do that. But but IEMs, you know, in a normal situation, yeah, you can accept that. And can so do you, are you feeding, is that why... Is that why you're feeding one reason you're feeding the drums and the bass into your system so that you can hear yeah. through them in your monitors? Oh no, the no 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 no. I'll t and you know, if, in a live situation, I'll still take the live mics and stuff and the live bass. Okay. But um, the so for what's coming from the drum mic, I mean, by the time it goes through my system, it's not going to come out sounding like a drum. You know, it's gonna right. it's gonna come out quite heavily modified. You know, even on the in the piano album with Kathy, you know. Um, there's a track called Bells where the piano comes back at her like two octaves up and swimming in delay and and there's a I, I remember the moment because that was accidental I didn't mean to do that <laughs> I sent it to her and I, I just got this beaming smile across from the piano you know and I remember wow okay that's that's working we're going to leave that you know so so the piano when it gets back into the same feed I'm never going to send a copy of the piano back to the, the main PA because obviously you get phase stuff you know Right. Yeah, I know. I just thought you might have like a separate direct unaffected feed coming into your system that you were listening to. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But you're, you're, the in-ears that you're listening to is basically coming back to you from the main desk where the, the mixer yeah. the mixer person is working. I get it. Yeah, so it's still, still like a regular setup in that way, but, um, but just you know, modifying bits of the live event as well. What what little amp head are you using for your amp sound? Um, I'm just using at, at the moment. I mean, I always I had an AC15 and I had an AC30. You know, for many years, those were my kind of favorite amps. Um, and and then obviously a Mesa. But I've, I've, at the moment, because I'm working out of an apartment and 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 the amount of gear that I have to take, I'm using the little MV, this um, Fox MV MV50. Which is their their little lunchbox head? I don't know if you've seen it. Okay, no. I mean, I had I had their uh, what are they called? The um, oh no, I'm thinking of the orange. Okay, yeah, it's kind of the version of the orange, like the orange Tiny Terror type size thing. This is this new tech. It's this um, what are they called? New tubes. Yeah. Which is that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw a thing with Premier Guitar. The guys were demoing it, and and I mean, there is a little. Uh, difference in the upper mid range, you can hear it's not quite, but man, it's it's pretty darn close. And for the fact that I can stick it in my guitar case and you know get out of here quick enough and and it still responds in a tubish way or tube enough way, it's it's pretty darn good. Um, Are you running into any latency issues these days? Uh, not so much. Uh, a couple of years ago, two three years ago, in the, in the time of that recording with Impor, yes. Um, once, you know, once you are willing to cough for an, you know, very, very expensive Mac, once you get over that reluctance, I guess is the, the phrase, the latency goes down a lot. So, so 64 milliseconds live is, is plenty cool, um, to work with. Uh, I find that, uh, the, the, the system will click. Uh, more from overloads than I'll get an experience of latency. Um, so if I push it too hard, I'll, I'll get clicks and dropouts. Um, but the the latency, I find 64 very acceptable. Some guys don't. Um, Wait, are you running you running the CPU at 64 or? So the the milliseconds on the on the sound card. Oh, okay. But but uh, what what are you running the CPU on the computer? Is at 128 or 250? You know, in Ableton. The, uh, oh, so sure. Let me answer that question. The buffer. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah the buffer. I'm I'm running it at 64, 64 wow. samples. You're running all that stuff at 64. Yeah. Uh, you must you must have a super Mac live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the live I'm using the the 2018. The top of the line 2018 laptop and right. that that was that was worth it you know that was really worth it it hurt at the time yeah. and then uh and then now if i'm in studio now i'm working in the studio i bought uh, the latest um mac mini the m1 which was super affordable like really 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 inexpensive little machine 
and absolutely fantastic. So I took the gamble because it wasn't, you know, the plug-in manufacturers and DAW manufacturers were saying it's not ready yet and we haven't tested it. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have a go at that price. So the M1, you know, the M1 I'm, uh, a Mac Mini is pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, is, that, is that just a processor that you're using with a keyboard and a separate keyboard and a, uh, and a screen or is that a laptop? No, you know, the Mac Mini is just the box. You know, right. So that you have to, you have to, you know, the Mac thing. You have to spend a fortune on a keyboard and buy your own screen. So, but but I just found I found this new M1 chip is like really really. I mean, the machine is quiet. You know, the one thing with the laptops, especially if you're trying to say record classical guitar or acoustic guitar, the fans are super loud. You know, once you start driving in Ableton, the thing gets really really hot. But the Mac Mini is absolutely silent. So, fantastic. And and all your software and Ableton is working with it and all the yeah. other software is working with it. Yeah, yeah. I, Ableton, Waves, and Native Instruments. I'm just looking at the bottom here. Yeah. Max. Yeah, it's all it's all happy. Do you think do you think if we say Mac enough, they'll give us a free one? Don't get me started. I mean, I like to say I'm in an, in an <laughs> abusive relationship with Apple. <laughs> it's like like most abusive relationships, you know, I love it, but it abuses me on a regular basis. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred dollars for this Mac, but like one hundred and fifty for the dongle that you need to make it work. That thing, uh, ev everything, anything that says Mac on it is going to be twice as expensive as. Anything else. <laughs> and, uh, but you know that's why we use it is because they work. I mean, I have to say, for all the issues I had playing live with the interface. The computer never crashed. The computer right. never down, and and I just saw an interview with somebody who does, um, you know, tracks for big bands, huge bands, and they said, you know, they use Apple because they would never use Windows because they're just the you know they know with the Mac it's going to work day after day after day after day and right you know, viruses and yeah. So for all the issues I've had with them on so many levels, it's um, you know that's why we use them. So well, where I, do you, where do you take um, where do you take this from here? Where do you where do you feel you want to take the technology technology aspect of it? Um, well, at the moment, you know, I've just um, you know, I've done those uh, three albums are complete. I'm busy with the solo albums. So the fourth one of that series will be solo. Um, so I want to finish that and release that by the end of April or so. Um, and that'll kind of close up a, 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 a period for me. At the moment, um, I've just, I'm living in the UK at the moment. So I was based in Johannesburg always. And at the moment, um, I kind of moved over to Nottingham uh, in January. So I'm speaking to you from there at the moment. And uh, right now, I mean, there's a huge, huge, serious lockdown here. It's crazy. We I haven't met anyone, really, in, in two or three months. And and so it'd, it'd be really nice to kind of meet other musicians and work with them um, live. Um, so I feel the thing is really stable enough. So I'd really like to get into other different situations and, and work with other musicians, both um, both live, I guess, and, and, and studio, but live in the studio if possible. You know, that's the big thing. So... Um, I think the thing is settling down for me in many ways, in the sense that I'm 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 really comfortable to take it into studio now, and I could do a, a bunch of live improvisation um, with confidence. You know, there's no the, the the butterflies of whether the thing's going to fall apart or not are gone. That's the one thing about this system as it stands. The next big move um, from the, the explorative side of things is is definitely into the modular side, and um, I've just so much I've so loved what that does in in an improvisatory standpoint so or session so you know the on the trio record there's there's drum loops that are um sequences that are um have got lfos which are spitting out variation into them all the time so switching the gates the notes on and off and changing the note values and the direction of the sequencer but i've got that worked out in ways that are like a sixth of the tempo and a fourth of the tempo a fourth of the tempo for the gates and a sixth of the tempo for the velocity and a a half of the tempo for probability. So the whole thing just moves, it never repeats. And so that's that's really exciting. Now I wanna really take that, you know, onto the stage now where that, that that has not been on the stage yet. So so yeah, I mean, working with other people, that's 
I'm looking out for that at the moment. And, and then taking this iteration live would be amazing to see what that would do. Um, cause the live energy is slightly different. And then, and then, yeah, I mean, just from my own gratuitous need to build bigger pieces of gear, I mean, modular is where it's at. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks Jonathan. This has been so great. It's, it's, it's perfect. Um, We'll talk a little after I shut off the recorder, but uh, I just want to thank you for for doing the interview, and uh, and I think people are going to get an enormous amount out of it. And thanks for being a fan of the site. You thank know. you.